Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to yet another Centerpiece Seminar. So today's speakers, in plural, are Ana Gascon and Bill Shadwick. Uh, they are from the Omega Analysis Research Company, but they've also been visiting IMPA for the last few years. Um, and uh, we're going to hear them talk about a new approach to epidemiological models. And of course, that's a, a very hot topic, and I think they'll have very interesting things to tell us about it. Thanks, Roberto. So we're, we've, <coughs> you know, we have, we had uh, started on this when it was an even hotter, uh, unfortunately, even hotter topic than it, than it later became. Um, but <coughs> we've been following uh, events in England where they're on their fourth now Omicron outbreak since last December. And there's another one coming. I guarantee there is another one coming in December. So um, there's still a, <coughs> we think, a, a great pr premium on understanding how to make useful predictions about the course of these things. And that's what we set out to do oh, two and a half years ago. And uh, we put a paper on the Med Archive preprint server on, uh, well, in Canada and, and the UK at least, Boxing Day, the day after Christmas of 2021. So that, that reference I didn't mark in here, but if you go to medarchive.org and search Cascon and Chadwick, you'll find the paper immediately. So our approach is to use data, not assumptions. That's, uh, that may sound, that may sound uh, conventional, but it's not in the case of epidemiological modeling. Uh, in fact, it's exactly the opposite there. The, all the models are based on assumptions, not data. So we've developed a model that makes accurate real-time predictions of epidemic events. We've concentrated on hospital admissions because that is the key. That's the critical fear generator in epidemics, as we've seen to our cost all over the world. Politicians, hospital administrators, frightened that the hospitals are going to be overflowing, are willing to do anything to stop that, to try to stop that. So <coughs> the predictions work equally well for cases, deaths, ICU uh, use, and so on. But the focus has been, in, and is on, in the paper, on hospitalizations. So this model, as often models do, should do in science, produces conjectures about things you haven't seen yet, things that you can test by going out and doing observations. And <coughs> there are several conjectures, I'll tell you some uh, in this, and several inferences that you can draw from this, the fact that this model works so well allows you to draw inferences about the way viral epidem epidemics behave. And um, <coughs> one of the major uh, conjectures is being tested right now against observations by geneticists. I'll come back to that. So I th I'm <coughs> in our minds, this is the basis for a new data-driven beginning for the use of models in epidemiology. Models have got to have had a very poor press, uh, and often very deservedly, over the last few years. I remember a comment from a, an Australian senator who made a, an impassioned speech about uh, not making the same mistakes again. And he said, if there's one thing I never want to hear again, it's modeling. One word I never want to hear again. When, he said, in retrospect, have any of these models been correct? Well, that's, I, I was really pained to see that, to see that comment. I mean, because models, mathematics mo does modeling. This is one of the absolute triumphs of human in in invention. Right? We do modeling based on laws of nature that allows us to see into the future. And that's what we see in physics and in engineering sciences and applied sciences. Laws of nature transferred into mathematical formulations 
and <coughs> models that are used to pre predict things, whether it's a Mars lander trajectory or at a much lower level of precision, the landfall of a hurricane. Unfortunately, there are no known laws of viral dynamics. One cannot simply write down the equivalent of Newton's <coughs> equations and start solving them. So, oh, that's annoying. This is a feature of the PDF. All right, well, uh, or maybe we're being censored. I don't know. Um, that uh, black space contains uh, the headline of a, of a paper that was published, the front page of a paper that was published in the Journal of Hygiene, uh, Cambridge Journal of Hygiene, in 1973. And the basis of that paper is the fact that in an Antarctic expedition, after 17 weeks of complete isolation, six of the 12 members of this British Antarctic Survey mission developed a common cold. Okay, so if you've been listening to people or perhaps telling people that separation makes common sense, if people are separated, they can't transmit viruses, um, you might ask yourself who it was that patient zero should have isolated himself from on that Antarctic base. He was there for 17 weeks with no contact with anyone, and then he got a cold, and so did five of his fellows. Now, <coughs> that's uh, relevant because the common cold is a coronavirus. It's endemic, we know that. So it's almost certain that this virus was carried there with him. It's not likely it was on a surface in Antarctica or in a tin of, of spam, uh, he took it there with him, and so probably did the others. Uh, but it's not an experiment we can do. <clears throat> so you might think, well, that's totally different from the situation with COVID-19, which was not endemic. But in fact, wastewater samples have found COVID-19 in as early as September, or perhaps even August of 2019. Okay, long before we have any outbreak in China. So that virus was around for a long time, some variation of it. And the same thing <coughs> uh, could well have happened uh, with or without people isolating themselves. So <coughs> our model, uh, based on data, we, we spent a long time accumulating uh, data of viruses uh, from the past. And one thing we found out is that that's not e an easy task. In, in fact, I almost got into an argument, well, I did get into an argument, with a very distinguished uh, fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study when I asked him about sources for data. And he came back very abruptly and said, look, look I don't have time to search through, search through papers and find data for you. I thought, you mean there's no database? There's no place where you go and look up the data of, the, of these things that have happened in the past? People study them all the time. And you read their paper and you look at the reference. And there might be a link. Chances are if there is, it won't work. Right. So you might write to them. They don't answer, I'd say, about 90% of the time and ask for the data. Well, do they have the data? Do you have the data you used to do some run 10 years ago? Maybe, maybe not. I don't, right? I have a hard time finding those things. But the fact is that <coughs> until recently, the, the advent of the COVID epidemic, where there's now way too much data, way too much data, there's been very little chance for someone who wanted to fit a model to data to do that. Because you can't make it up. Well, actually, you can. Simulated data is used all the time in the modeling community to test models. So you test your model by looking at the output from another model. Well, you get, you get what we got. So here's the outline. We'll, we'll talk about this model and its relationship to seasonal influenza. Then uh, a bit about real-time prediction of COVID-19 hospital admissions in England. We've been doing that uh, since November of last year. Um, we gave up trying to tell people that you could do this before the preprint was posted because 
there was no way they were going to believe us. But we did start looking at it in November, and we were, we were ready to go, which was a, a fortunate time because that's when Omicron hit. Uh, the scientific advisory board for the British government had a complete panic attack and tried to convince the politicians to, as they say in England, cancel Christmas and very narrowly missed doing that. For an, for an outbreak that turned out, <coughs> as we had predicted, to be about half as severe as the previous winters. Right. So, um, testable predictions about viral behavior, viral epidemics, forensic use of the model to examine the past. I'm, I'm not using forensic in the perhaps strict sense of the word here. There's no uh, legal case being made yet. Um, it's really an examination of claims that were made, things that were believed, and <coughs> checking what they, what they look like with <coughs> the benefit of a model that actually works. So I'm going to show you a number of examples. Um, epidemic events, cumulative events, which is already a departure from the standard approach to modeling, where what you will see is the sequence of events, very noisy, and then you'll see a plausible fit that goes sort of through that cloud of noisy events. Uh, on the other hand, the cumulative is a natural smoothing of that same data. So we looked at the cumulative, um, <coughs> and we'll show you a number of those. And the curves that are shown, you'll see fit the data very well, are Gumpert's functions that have been <coughs> chosen to make that best fit. Now, if you don't know what a Gumpert's function is, you will in a minute. And I'll tell you about the fitting as well. So here's the first one. It goes back 170 years. This is cholera in Denmark. And for those of you who may <coughs> remember the, the public health lore about the uh, John Snow um, removing a pump handle and stopping a, a cholera epidemic in London. This was a year before that happened. Nobody stopped this. It stopped itself. Nobody knew about bacteria. Uh, nobody knew why cholera happened. They just knew it was extremely serious when it did. Half of the people, no more than half of the people who were infected here died. Right. And this was a, over a course of a few weeks. The Spanish flu. Uh, the Prussians were good at record keeping, I guess. We have daily data on deaths in Prussia, even though it's after the war ended. Um, well, not quite. It begins in <coughs> a little before that. Um, and this is one of the rare cases where we actually know daily information about the Spanish flu. Most of it is weekly, which already has a lot of information. but. This is what looked like with SARS, the SARS outbreak in Hong Kong in 2003. Ebola cases in Sierra Leone in the 2014-15 outbreak. These are weekly from the World Health Organization situation reports, which, by the way, are only available as PDFs. Somebody went through this data, not us. Somebody else went through this data and, and <coughs> scanned it and, and manually took out the, the, the numbers right. um, from PDF. Oh, sorry, that was Zika in, in the state of Antioquia in Colombia in 2016. And then here is one of uh, a number of, of uh, gold mine finds we got by accident. Um, Gabriela Gomez, a Portuguese mathematician, some of you may know, was working on, on COVID. Uh, and when we asked her about data for Portugal, the source she gave us included yearly uh, records of daily influenza diagnoses in Portugal from 2016 onwards. So this is a, as I say, this is a gold mine. Uh, we called it the influenza observatory in our, in our paper, I guess. So when you, now that you've seen all of those, do you think anything unusual was happening here? Is this something out of the, out of, off of Mars, as I like to say? This is the deaths in China at the beginning of <coughs> 2020. Uh, they go, this, this data goes until, I think, within a couple of days, 
the China, you see you've got 3,500 people there-ish, and the next day they dumped 1,600 or 2,000 new ones on in one day. So there was just this enormous jump in the data, and it's hopeless to look at it after that. But this is real data. That's what was happening in Wuhan. Here's what was happening with hospitalizations in the state of Rio de Janeiro. This is data from SUS. Here's what's happening in Ontario a year later. Here's what's happening <coughs> in England just a few months ago. Okay. Well, I'm sure you noted there's a pattern there. <laughs> the red curve fits the data to a ridiculously good degree. If that was an experiment with error bars on things, you, you might be wondering when you were going to get your Nobel Prize. The fits are ridiculously good. Okay. So the thing that they're fitting, the red curve, is a, is a Gompertz function, which is obtained by just multiplying <coughs> a probability distribution, in this case the Gumbel distribution, by a number n. Of course, as the probability distribution has its limit as t goes to infinity, goes to 1, this whole thing goes to n. So n is the asymptotic number of events, whether it's cases, deaths, ICU admissions, hospitalizations. That's the asymptotic picture. Okay. Time here is in, in days. Um, all the, <coughs> the units make, make sense. So the three parameters you can find directly from the event data using nonlinear regression. So if you, if you don't know what that is, but you know what linear regression is, is just the same process uh, finding the best fit to a parameterized family of curves by minimizing the, the average squared error. Okay. Now, of course, the difference is for linear regression, there's a formula for that. And for nonlinear regression, there isn't. So you have, to, you have to use a computer program for this. There are probably thousands of off-the-shelf solutions to that problem. Certainly there's in the Python library there are there are <coughs> there are programs. Maple has a nonlinear regression routine. I'm sure that Mathematica does as well, whatever Wolfram calls this thing now, does as well. So what you see in <coughs> in the pictures I've just showed you the final stage of this. Okay, I haven't showed you the progression. You don't find that final Gumpert's function immediately. And a, a lot of effort was put into a futile search for ways of discovering the final Gumpert's function very early on in the epidemic. Right? Um, Michael Levitt from Stanford uh, put a huge amount. I think he still believes that you can do that, but I mean, we, can, we can actually prove that you can't. Um, I think. I need to go to the desktop to show you a movie. Yeah, so here's an example of the process of fitting the Chinese data. So the pale red curve is the final Gompertz function. You're seeing the data as it flows out through, the, through time. You're seeing the parameter, uh, parameter values following their route to convergence. These are some very big moving at the beginning. Right. Um, but you see also that pretty quickly the thing locks on. But even before it has, the new points don't get very far from the previous fit. Right. So far, what does far mean? Well, you know, this is epidemiology, this is not physics. Close might be within 15, 20 percent. I'll show you some examples of what the CDC thinks is, is close. I'll one example at the end. The goal we set ourselves was to make estimates that would be within 10 percent over a period of a week or more. Right? The reasoning being that if you're a competent administrator and you know within 10 percent what your load is going to be, you should be able to manage it. Okay. Um, <coughs> competent administrators may be rarer than we would hope. But um, this is absolutely typical. And in the paper, you can see lots of analyses of the errors in these various cases. And you see it always looks the same. You, say you have these large 
movements at beginning, and then quickly you narrow it down, and the parameters are locked in to the final curve. Okay. So, let's see if I can manage this now. <laughs> oh dear, no, I've done something wrong. Hmm. Sure. Ah, this good. Uh, a question. So uh, we know that in COVID there were like different waves. Yes. So uh, the graph that you are showing, uh, well, up to my understanding, corresponds to one wave. Yes. In, if there are many, do you just uh, do the same thing, but sub subsequently uh, with different functions? You like to jump ahead. Of course, I'm <laughs> you're right, right? Okay. And, and that's one of the, f um, Roberto, can you, I I'm, I'm not sure if it's, yeah, is it going to go page at a time now? No. No. Ah. Yeah, I can't read the. <laughs> yeah, so what happens is um, we'll see uh, fairly quickly. Thanks. Not yet. Not yet. So the, the pictures I showed you, um, some of them are complete. That is, nothing happens after that. Okay. Cholera, for example, it stopped. It just stopped. Both the cases and the deaths stopped. Um, the SARS outbreak stopped. Ebola stopped. Um, <laughs> it's frustrating. No, I spent some time trying to figure out how to do this um, and failed. <laughs> right. So um, we'll come to, th to that. It turns out that, that you should think of the, each of these uh, initial Gumford's function waves as carrying on to its end. That, that's, a, that's a variant. It turns out that other variants take up the case after that. So you may remember that, um, yeah, it's one of those, isn't it? Change the PDF. Yeah, I think the it's one. the wrong plot. Oh, it's the wrong PDF, I think. Uh, okay. Well, it should be. Oh, okay. There's two people. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so I don't need to. Yeah. I don't need to do this again. So <laughs> we'll just stick with this one. We should be yeah. fine. But now I think it'll. Does this work? Let's see. Yeah. This yeah. Great. Sorry. So, um, <clears throat> we'll, well, well, Yuli has introduced the next slide. So, so the, the Gompertz function is just the first part of the model. There's another piece, and that's. <clears throat> That's what's observed in seasonal influenza uh, first. Well, actually, it was observed in the Prussian Spanish flu deaths. What happens is that the Gompertz growth stop, the, 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 the uh, process stops following Gompertz growth and starts off on a tangent with linear growth. Linear growth. Now, that, um, <clears throat> That's the model, basically. What you see is an alternation of Gompertz function growth and linear growth. Now, we'll, we'll come back. To, there's, a, there's more sort of under the surface there. But that's enough to give you good predictions, because during the Gompertz function growth, you do a fit, you extrapolate along that fit out into the future, and that works for several days at a time, weeks at a time as you go, with the accuracy, say, within 10%. Then you get into the linear phase. Well, even an epidemiologist can predict that. It's linear extrapolation. Okay. I should say even a doctor can predict that. You're just doing linear extrapolation, and that works very well. Okay. And what you see is actually in the, in the influenza data over a period of many years, what you see is that pattern repeated again and again and again. You get a big Gompertz function outbreak in the winter, then you get a transition to linear growth, well, actually piecewise linear growth, with the slopes falling as you go through the summer and then off to the races again. After another Gompertz burst 
in September, October. Then another linear growth in November, then you're back into the main event again. Okay. So that's, that pattern um, is painfully apparent when you look at the Portuguese data. I guess we may have been the only people who've ever looked at the data. I'm not sure why the Portuguese are collecting it. It it's, could well be an EU directive of some sort. But uh, it does, this, this feature doesn't seem to be at all well known. But already at this point, we can predict hospital admissions. So there's, that goal has been, has been satisfied. In principle, okay. now the linear part is easy. Really, that's, everybody can do that. Okay. The part that, <coughs> that you, have to, you have to think about is the transition. Well, you're just observing the transition in the Gompertz function growth to linear growth phase. And that's, that's again, very, very easy to handle. The other end is, is where it gets, where it gets uh, trickier, uh, certainly more worrying if you're relying on these predictions. Because you've got to pick up, first of all, you've got to pick up the fact that the linear growth is over. Well, that part, that, that part is okay. You just, you're going to see uh, over a period of a week or two weeks that the slope is not where it, where it was before. It's gone up. That's your signal that the new outbreak is in the offing. But what do you do next? Because it takes several weeks before the signal really settles down. So now you're facing, you know, a new, or well, we know, a new outbreak. You don't know how big it's going to be. You can't know how big it's going to be until those parameters have settled down. And what you need to do is find some realistic way of bounding the events, cumulative events, until that uh, Gompertz function predictive power, which will come, but until it cuts in. And you simply cannot predict how long that will, will take. So um, we've, we've been approaching that um, through, through a, a natural uh, idea in statistics. If you, certainly, if you're looking at any, uh, any events that are damaging and you know there's no bound on how big they can get, floods, for example. You know what the worst flood was um, <coughs> in the last 100 years, or maybe ever if you're in Egypt, you know, back thousands of years. But there's no reason to believe that it could never get worse than that, right? Absolutely none. In fact, you know it has to get worse than that at some point. That's the way it's always been. The record didn't start with, the, with Noah and, and diminish since then. It's been going up and down, up and down. So the question you want to ask is a question for statisticians, which is what is the, <coughs> you don't know what the worst thing that could happen is, but you can calculate based on data <clears throat> what's the average I should be expecting, conditional on being worse than it's already been? Right. And in fact, that's a, a question for extreme value statistics, which, which sounds a little more exotic than it really is. But if you, if you don't know about the subject, think of a case in which you're sampling some random variable, but not from the whole distribution, instead from one of its tails. You're looking at the, only the biggest things, the things above two sigma from the mean or three sigma from the mean or whatever. Okay, and so that's <coughs> what, we, what we're seeing when these outbreaks start is that there is <coughs> a new, new biggest admissions day, something big enough to tip up what was a line into a, into a, a line with a higher slope over a period of a few days, a week. I mean, there's, this is subjective. You've got to try and do, figure out how to, how to handle this. Um, but you've got the biggest number of admissions, M, and now you want to know, given the distribution of these things, what's the average condition on being bigger than M? Okay. And then you do that again, belt and braces, twice, say. What's the biggest condition? If level one is the condition on <coughs> exceeding M, the average condition on exceeding M. Level two is the average condition on exceeding level one. Level three is the average condition on exceeding level two. Right. Well, it's a, a t high school, uh, arithmetic exercise to, to see that if, if you've got those things right, if, if, the, if the subsequent emissions, uh, <coughs> admissions 
uh, actually, on average, fall below these levels, then linear growth at those levels will bound to the cumulative. It's just the, the fact that the cumulative is, is a multiple of the average, right? Uh, the number of days. So, so that's, what we've, that's what we try to do. Now, we do it using our own technology. Um, we do it using three weeks of data, including this period where the thing has popped up. We do it with that much data because these are very local in time outbreaks. As the outbreak in, of Omicron was vastly lower <coughs> amplitude events in England last year than the previous winter's outbreak had been. So um, could, you can approach this lots of different ways. There's an awful lot of data now um, of, of daily admissions to, to hospital in England. You can study that distribution of data. What we do is look at the most recent three weeks because we can. So we know this is not using stuff that's no longer applicable. It's fresh. Right. And what we do is, is compute. So you can see, you can see there's a, a, big, a big change here. The blue is the in sample. And then the out of sample is what we're trying to get a handle on by fitting extremes to what we see in the blue. Okay. And there's how it worked for that one. Um, Basically, we have a, I've just drawn it the simplest way possible. This is a fallback of, of, of bounds. You use the level one until it's breached by, say, 10%. You switch to level two. If that's breached, you go to level three. And what always happens in every example we've looked at so far is that these are good enough to, to keep you in the game until the Gompertz function predictability, predictive power cuts in. In this case, of course, the, the red, it's hardly surprising when you look at, at what happened, the red bound is ultimately over, overwhelmed. But only a week, a week before, no, no, I'm sorry, a week after, a week after the uh, Gumpert's function fit started meeting this criteria being within 10% for more than, in fact, in this case, I think it was three weeks into the future. Okay, so this kept us in, the, in control until the Gompertz function predictability cut in. Right. Um, <clears throat> By comparison, here's the, um, the, the Biden administration put $200 million, $200 million into a new center for forecasting and outbreak analytics in the United States directed by Mark Lipsitch from the Harvard uh, <coughs> Public School of Public Health. Now, Lipsitch, like, like his counterpart in, in England, is very clear that they don't make predictions. What they do with their models is give you a bunch of scenarios that might happen if you don't wear your mittens, if you do wear your mittens, if you go out in the rain, if you go out in the rain with too many people in your car, and so on. Okay, that's the idea that they have a bunch of scenarios. They can tell you somehow things will happen if something else, conditional on some other events taking place. They don't, however, make predictions. Now you might wonder, how do they know that their scenarios make sense? Well, they test them in models. Right? These are model world predictions of the model world. And it's easy to check that in the model world, the model tells you <laughs> that it's right. In the real world, it can be very different. And so what you have in the real world is a prediction for hospitalizations in the United States that's simply ridiculous. The 50% <coughs> bounds between 3,000 and 5,000, where the, the number is supposedly, and by the way, they don't tell you how it fit in the past. They only show you what happened in the past. They, it may be somewhere on their website, but I've never been able to find something that shows me how that prediction panned out. And I suspect there's a reason for that. But anyway, this is regarded as the state of the art. Right? Well, at least it's not my tax money. That's being wasted in Canada and, and in England. So here's one of the things you can use this model for. Um, we're making, so here's our, 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 our sort of credo. The thing fits so well 
that we should believe that that's describing the process, that the process is really a Gompertz function to a very high degree of accuracy. So that's what we believe. Now, given that we believe that, we should also believe that you get a good smooth model, which is what, of course, what all of these dynamical models for, for compartmental models and so on want to produce is a smooth model for the daily events. Well, the daily events are far from smooth and not because of measurement problems, right? These are, these are actual counts. Somebody's counted how many hospital visits there were that, or doctor's visits there were that resulted in a diagnosis of influenza in Portugal on a certain day. That's not a number that has error bars on it. Well, at least it, should, it shouldn't be. But you see that there's a lot of noise here. And if you look at it, if you can see it well enough, you'll see that that noise corresponds to weekends. All those dips are because either doctor's offices or hospital aren't open or hospitals are less friendly places to go on a weekend, or you don't want to bother, <coughs> you know, not be able to take the kids to soccer or whatever. And you, you might feel well, but you'll wait unwell, but you'll wait till Monday. So that noise is, is got nothing to do with the process that's driving influenza. So, you know, it makes perfect sense to look for a smooth version of it. People, uh, are pre presenting these things all over the place with a seven day, um, standard seven day average. So I'm looking at, uh, if, I, if you look at a, a given date, you're looking at the average of the, that day, the three after it and the three before it to make seven. So there's a the lag has been taken out by doing it that way. But of course it doesn't change the fact that you have to wait three more days to get the, to get the average after you get your data today. But you see that the smooth, uh, <coughs> smooth, uh, curve agrees very closely with the seven-day average. So we think it makes sense to regard that as the model for the process. It's a smooth version of the actual daily process. And it's obtained just by taking daily differences from the Gompertz function. So in fact, it's, it is smooth. It's real analytic. And in fact, this is one of these weird cases where it's not that the first difference uh, approximates the derivative. <laughs> it's that the derivative approximates the first difference. We can use the derivative when it's convenient um, as something that's going to be a very good approximation, the derivative. And that's because on the, if you think about the, the, the standard Gompertz uh, function, if you like, or the standard Gumbel distribution, the, the one day grid here with an A of, of, of a, you know, something less than, uh, never gets more than 0.1 and a bit corresponds to a grid size of 0.1 back in the, on the real line where the, <coughs> where the uh, Gumbel distribution lives. So one thing that you see here is a very pronounced asymmetry. It's, it's a little harder to see that in the cumulatives. You can when you look at it because it's a, you notice that the, the, the curvature changes not at halfway, but way to the, way to the, to the left of that. Okay. And in fact, where it changes, is at, <coughs> at 1 over e of the total n, OK? Is it a, uh, what the n is? So n is the, is the final uh, number, the asymptotic number of cases, deaths, whatever it is, right? And when the derivative peaks, or the daily difference peaks, almost exactly the same, um, <coughs> That's when the, the that's at, at time minus minus b over a, easy to check that, and at that point the Gompertz function's value is n divided by e, so about 0.37 of the total. And that's the peak, so that's the hard limit. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, in fact, there it is. So that has to be herd immunity threshold. Because every day after that, fewer, ca fewer cases, deaths, whatever, are produced than the day before. You've, had, you've hit the peak velocity, it's downhill from here. Now, of course, herd, herd immunity is talked about in terms of infections. Infections are not observable, right? Cases are observable, but usually wildly uh, <coughs> variable because of testing. Hospital admissions are, are solid, or deaths are very solid, usually. Um, but the fact is <coughs> that 
these peaks were reached very early. In the Northern Hemisphere, they were reached in late April or early May right, for an outbreak that started in March. Okay. Uh, in fact, even, er even earlier than that, even earlier than that. And this led to a great deal of controversy. People were saying, oh, it's all over now. It's a Gompertz function. We've passed the peak. Therefore, we've got herd immunity. And um, the, the conclusion that we have is that herd immunity is something that, that uh, is attached to a variant, not to a virus, as we know in influenza and we know in other, other airborne viruses and coronaviruses. You're not immune to influenza because you had it last year. You didn't get it twice last year because you're immune to the variant you got the first time, for a while, it seems. But the variant's changing all the time. Okay. So, um, and that, that's, um, f that's why it was impossible to, to, to uh, draw the conclusions that people were trying desperately to, to draw in 2020. They of course, everybody wanted this to be over. Uh, and in the first wave, which was a variant, was over when things started to flatten, flatten off. So um, there are some other consequences of this. Um, this. The reproduction number, as the Brits love to call it, the R number, uh, and it was quoted endlessly on television. I stopped watch, we stopped watching television here, so I don't know if the same thing happened. But, but in, in uh, Britain and Canada, it was quoted endlessly on television. But this is sup the, supposed to be the average number of people who are infected in future by one person who's infected now. Okay. Now that makes, that makes sense as a concept, whether you could ever measure it or not is another, another question, but there we are. Now, in that description, people immediately segued into, the, into t totally uh, implausible scenarios of exponential growth. The, my favorite is Bill Gates, noted intellectual, in his book on preventing the next pandemic. He gives this example. He says, you know, if 100 people had a virus and it doubled every day in whatever it is, a few weeks, it would be more than the population of the world. Well. It's not that he couldn't do the calculation. I checked. He, he rounded a bit oddly. But anyway, he was right more or less on the, on the, on the exponentiation. But that's a stupidly implausible idea. If that could happen, why are we here? Why didn't it already happen in thousands and thousands of years that people have been interacting with viruses? And how is it? I mean, try, if you want to think about networks, try and draw a graph where the number of people around me that are, <coughs> are never the ones that were back there, never already infected. But I always have infinite in all directions, a new crowd of people I can infect. And everybody I infect has the same thing. It's impossible, right? It's totally impossible. And this model shows that, it <coughs> that it's also completely wrong. That does not happen. These epidemics follow Gumpert's functions. And on a Gumpert's function, you can calculate this number. It's just the ratio of the difference n days from now, or whatever s serial number of days from now, to, the to today. You can compute that explicitly. And you see an, a, a function that independent of the serial interval, the length of time between infection and infectiousness, it declines steadily, almost, you might say, exponentially, not quite. But it declines at an incredible pace from the very beginning. And I mean, if you want another, there's a very, it's, it's a very simple exercise if you, if you <coughs> want to do some, some uh, nonlinear regression. Take some, take some early rapid growth uh, epidemic data. Okay? Fit an exponential to it. And then run ahead a few days and see how good your fit is. The only thing that's increasing exponentially is the error between your fit and the data. And that is growing exponentially. So, <coughs> one of the, the, the difficulties, of course, is that you can't observe inf infections, but you can observe uh, uh, cases, you can ob observe uh, hospitalizations, in intensive care uh, 
admissions, you can observe deaths. Okay. Now, it's an argument I won't try to go through here, but it's in the paper. It's not difficult at all. If, if those things really are proportional to each other with a time lag, which perfectly sensible thing to, to imagine they are, and, and we've got evidence that they are, in fact, from the Gompertz functions we compute. Then if you've got the Gompertz function for any one of them and you know the lag and you know the proportion, you've got Gompertz functions for all of them. Right? So this is, this is uh, uh, we can draw the same sort of conclusions. All the change, you have the same speed. This, the A parameter stays the same. What changes is the N, the, the final total, of course. These are proportional. And the time change is, <coughs> the, the time shift is, is reflected in the B. Right? It's a very simple uh, connection. Okay. So, um, so the R decreases, right? The R decreases steadily. I won't put the formula. It's very easy to calculate it from a, from a, a Gumbel distribution, for example. Of course, it doesn't depend on N because it's a ratio of, of two things that start with N. All right. And it doesn't go to zero. I think in, in, the, in the paper, we actually say it goes to zero, where we meant to say that the cases are going to zero. This is there's a like, fractal-like behavior that's blocked by the fact that you can't have less than one person. And so these things do go to zero as soon as the number of people involved is, say, less than a half. Right? But the, um, <coughs> the model thing uh, has, an, uh, has an asymptotic behavior. Sigma is the, uh, the serial interval. It goes to e to the minus a sigma. So here's, here's another uh, cut at, at what Yulia asked about. At the end of the picture I drew for the Spanish flu in Prussia, there were still cases being reported. But it's no longer following a Gumpert's function. Instead, it's following a straight line to a very, very high degree of precision. Okay. The same thing happened in hospital admissions in London. That's what we saw in the spring of 2020. That's what we saw, well, we would have seen in the spring of 2020 if we'd looked at it then. We saw this much later. It took us a while to figure out what was going on. But exactly the same thing happens in the Portuguese influenza case data. Even in 2020, so even in a year where influenza supposedly is wiped off the map, there's still recognizable behavior of this, exactly the same sort in the Portuguese influenza case data. So um, Sinatra Gupta made a very nice little video about endemic disease and, and explains that it, it must be the case when you have endemic disease that the reproduction number is one. It doesn't explode and it doesn't disappear. Okay. Um, <coughs> but when things are growing, when the cumulatives are growing linearly, you have to have the reproduction number of one. You have the same number of people appearing in these slots every time period, right? So that, that's by definition uh, of, the, of the reproduction number, you know it's one, okay? Now, <coughs> um, T technically, I should be only thinking about this in terms of infections, but all of the other things proceed from infections. So we can, we can f see that this must have happened by the time we start seeing this linear behavior in, in any of the downstream uh, event graphs. Okay. But now something odd is going on because uh, as you move past that peak time, the, the reproduction number is declining, declining, declining. It's well below one as you follow the Gompertz function, but it's equal to one in the cumulative events. So is there some shock that's causing a jump discontinuity in the, in the Gompertz function's uh, uh, reproduction number? I, I don't think that's very plausible. But there's another simple explanation, and that's that the Gompertz function continues on its merry way with its reproduction number declining, and some new variant is filling the space. And the weighted average of those two, or maybe more, reproduction numbers is turning out as one. Okay. So this, this also fits with a picture of, of why the virus behaves the way it does. Why, why has it evolved to do what it's doing? Um, 
why does it want to peak when it's only uh, chewed through 37% uh, of this final allocation? And I think the answer is actually uh, fairly intuitive. Once he's gotten to N, he's done. Viruses don't reproduce, right, except within somebody else's cells. And the limit in his Gumpert's function package is N. That's what he gets. That's his legacy, except that the longer the virus spends getting to that end, the more mutations he can spin off. And the better for virushood all over the place because some of those mutations are going to be variants that are, uh, that, are <coughs> that the people he's made immune are, no are not immune to in future or people that never got the first one might get the second one. Okay. So it's, it's completely plausible, it fits with this, I mean, the, there's a, there's an approach to viral, viral behavior that people call a swarm, viral swarm, where it's the sort of cloud of all the viruses kind of competing, helping each other. And they seem to actually communicate. There are, there are lab experiments where you seem to have one virus telling another, no, no, there's no lunch here, right? Go to the next, to the next restaurant. Um, <coughs> so this, this, of course, is a conjecture that every time we see this, this linear behavior pop out, it's because there's a new variant. Well, there are people who are cataloging variants and they have a t time scale. They know when they appeared. Right. And one of, the, one of the groups studying this, um, <coughs> they've published some very interesting stuff about it already, is Francois uh, Bellou in, in University College London with Lucy Van Dorp and, and Damien Richard. And they're working with us now on this to, to to compare these times with the with the out <coughs> with with viral new emergence of new variants. Okay, and so far it's looking very good. So um, here's here's the sort of for I took the forensic part out uh, for this title of the slide at least, but this is the the part where we're just taking a hard look at what happened in the past through the lenses of this new analysis. Um, and of course, m by now, many, many people have done studies trying to understand the cost-benefit analysis in terms of economics, uh, in terms of, of uh, medical problems caused versus medical problems avoided, and so on, of the extreme measures that were taken to counteract, to attempt to counteract the, the virus. Um, you might wonder when you look at all those nice, smooth Gumpert's functions, whether you wouldn't be able to see the place where those interventions had their successes. But you don't. You just see a nice, smooth curve. Um, so we don't have any, uh, any uh, leverage on, on uh, analyzing cost-benefit. But we do have another tool, because you get a very sharp peak for deaths using the daily model. And you can put error bounds on it using the, the standard error from the, from the, from the nonlinear regression fits. And they're very tight. Because this, these things just snap into place, as you saw in the video. By the end, the, the data is <laughs> sucked up into the curve. It, it's not going anywhere else. Okay. So those are very good estimates. And um, oh now um, somebody who's Anyway, the, the other thing that's very well understood at this point is how long it takes between infection and death if you actually have an infection that turns out to be fatal. And it's three weeks. Of course, it's a distribution, not a, not a number. But it's, let's say it's three, it's three weeks to a very good, uh, to a very good <coughs> level. So you can count back from the peak in deaths to find out when the peak in infections happened. And in fact, uh, um, someone whose name I've forgotten from the University of Edinburgh did this uh, to uh, rebut claims that were being made about millions of lives having been saved by actions of the UK government. Um, and what he, uh, what he did <coughs> was to, to count back from places where his, uh, his analysis showed uh, deaths had peaked. And he found that they happened to... Uh, too early, 
to have been influenced by the measures. Okay. So um, we can count back. We might as well go right back to the font of this. The, uh, the World Health Organization went to Wuhan and looked at the numbers. In fact, in an interview, Bruce Aylward, uh, World Health Organization epidemiologist, showed a picture, a graph uh, of deaths in Wuhan and drew the conclusion that the peak had been reached and passed because of the interventions. Well, when you do this calculation, where you see a sharp number day for the, for the peak of deaths and work backwards 21 days. That 21 days is before they even closed the train station and the airport. And that was a week or so, I think, before they closed businesses, et cetera, in Wuhan. So there is no conceivable way that that was the cause, given that even in epidemiology, the cause has to precede the effect. It did not. Um, <clears throat> so those things could not have done what the World Health Organization deceived themselves into thinking and then uh, deceived the rest of the world into adopting. And apparently the Chinese still don't know this. Right? They're still doing massive lockdowns in Shanghai and many other places. Which is a, a, a good antidote to the, to the idea that the Chinese data was somehow faked is that they would have had to know enough to fake it in the form of a Gompertz function, and the Gompertz function is what proves the lockdown didn't work. So I think we can rule that one out. So the other, the other thing is, is work in progress, well, most of which has been done but not written up, and that's <coughs> looking back in a period of 2005, 2007, uh, after the World Trade Center attacks, and there was an anthrax attack, I can't remember exactly what date that was, but by 2005, there was a concerted campaign going on in uh, Washington to include pharmaceutical, non-pharmaceutical interventions, school closures, shutdowns, uh, non-essential activities, all the things we're used to now, having heard into the pandemic influenza response policies for the United States. It's always pandemic influenza until now that people have been geared up to deal with. In fact, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the modeling group in the UK is specifically the pandemic influenza modelers. Right? That's their background job. Right? What they did was to look at uh, Spanish flu cases in the United States in the 1918-19. Uh, and th there was, a, I find, amazing degree of unanimity from these studies with the conclusion that it was the interventions that caused different waves. It was the relaxation of interventions that caused a new wave to break out and so on, all very pat. Uh, and all supposedly supported by modeling, as they like to say. Well, those models, you can, you can find them in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The fits that those models produced are pathetically poor. We have things that fit. If you look at a Gumpert's function, you get an extremely good fit. Even though we're fitting the cumulative, you get an extremely good fit to the, to the weekly events. So I'm inclined to believe conclusions drawn from the model that actually fits the data, not the conclusions drawn from models that are unbelievably poor fits to the data. So that's, that's, that's coming. Uh, there are many, many f further applications that are possible. Uh, vaccine development, you can pick out places where a new variant has arrived. You don't want to roll your, your vaccine out two months after the new variant when you've based it on one from two, two variants ago, for example. Um, there's no reason why you can't make dynamic as opposed to a phenomenological epidemic model, now that we know what the output has to, has to be, look like. In fact, n none of this constant coefficient models can produce Gumpert's functions. Just work backwards, it's impossible. Right? It has to be heterogeneous. And, and you can see why, because the reproduction number has to be declining monotonically uh, at a terrible clip. Um, viral processes in the lab, I mean, there was a, there was a, uh, um, 
a trick slide in here, uh, cholera. Someone, um, Yule is gone, but she might have objected that it's not viral, it's bacterial, which of course many of you know, I'm sure. So you don't get immunity to a bacterial in, uh, disease, but you do develop some immunity to cholera, and you know how? By bacteriophage viral activity in your gut. So <laughs> it's entirely possible that what you're seeing in the cholera picture is the action of those bacteria, of the bacteria being wiped out by the virus. It could well be the virus is driving this Gompert's behavior. And in fact, there's another clue about that. Um, it, it turns out the geometry of the affine group on the line uh, endows every univariate probability distribution with a Hamiltonian system. So there's an energy. Now most of them are totally boring, just like most probability distributions are boring. Some of them are very special, like the Gumbel distribution, which is one of the extreme value distributions. It's very special. And it corresponds to constant curvature and has as its energy the, um, the square of the logarithmic derivative. You might think, well, the simplest mechanical system, maybe I should have the square of the derivative. That gives you the exponential distribution. And there are no viruses <laughs> and no humans in that model of the world, right? It just goes whoo, zoom right through to the end, no fade out, and everybody's gone. Um, variant fingerprints and so on. So this is just the beginning. I think um, I, should, I should stop there and, and uh, leave the time for, que for questions. <coughs> Thanks, Bill. Um, do we have questions? I certainly have a few, but... Uh. <laughs> uh, I have a question, which... Uh, so, why, why Gumpert's functions? Or do you have any intuition of why this fits so well, the data? Yeah, there's, there's, um, so one of the, one of the things is the extreme value attractors. So you probably know, I, you've done some work with extreme values, but, but um, if you look at uh, a distribution and uh, take a draw from it and then select the biggest number that comes out in that, in that draw and keep doing that, as the number of draws goes to infinity, number of samples goes to infinity, that will approach a distribution. Most of the time, I mean, it, it's, it's basically never, almost never going to be the distribution you started with. If you're drawing from the tail of a normal distribution, that's not going to be normally distributed, right? Um, so there are certain attractors which, independent of any conditions, like uh, you don't need means, you don't need uh, even finite means. So um, there, there are three families. The, the, the Gumbel distribution is, is one of them that attract these tail behavior. And so if you go, another way of thinking about that is if you go far enough out in the tail of any distribution in the attract, zone of attraction, it will be close to a Gumbel distribution, right? If it's in that, that uh, light-tailed version, right, where all the, all the, all the uh, moments are finite. Well, if we stay within that, which is not unreasonable because it's, it's going to take forever for a fresh A distribution to, to converge. Right? If we stay within that light-tailed version, everything's going to start looking like a Gompertz function at some point. Now, where, where's that point? It turns out that on the scale that we're looking at, you basically can't tell the difference between anything that's in the attractor of a Gompertz function and a Gompertz function, I mean, a, a, a Gumbel distribution, after about 50 percentile. Now the beginning we see by experiment has to be somewhere that the curvature change is somewhere around 0.37. Well, there's not a lot of room left, right? So th that's a, a sort of intuition of why this m may be going on. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah. okay. Uh, thank you. That answered my question. I had a <laughs> follow-up, but maybe I can follow up offline. Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, so there's three classes of uh, of attractors on those. That's classes, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this is like uh, the generalized. Uh, 
Well, the like Pareto distributions are sort of duals to these things. So the, 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 the short-tailed ones include the exponential distribution, for example. Uh, those are on the, I mean, in the original setup, those are defined on the left half line, right? Then the Frechet distributions are the heavy-tailed heavy things, like Cauchy, the Cauchy distributions in the attractor of Frechet. And then probably every distribution in your standard you know, uh, uh, probability textbook is one of the light-tailed ones that converges to the to the to the Gumbel distribution. Oh, okay. So okay. most of now them are, yeah. you're starting with a distribution. You know, no matter what, you're starting with a distribution because if <laughs> if you look at x over n, as long as as long as x is um, n times something, this thing is now uh, Let's say it goes from uh, from from uh, zero infinity to zero one. It's a probability distribution, no matter what. Right. So it, now people look at it models where it's the logistic distribution. That's a, but that's symmetric. And if you try fitting data from, a, from an epidemic to a logistic distribution, you'll find it's a crap fit. <laughs> because it insists on putting the, the inflection point at 50% of n. And in fact, the data wants it to be at 37%. So if the data is like this, the the <coughs> the logistic fit will do something like this. It'll, it'll, come, it'll be too, too high back here and too low up here. But you can, you can experiment easily just fitting some for yourself. Thanks. More questions? <laughs> She always has one. That's <laughs> uh, Phil, I don't think it was very clear the relationship between re reproduction number and the search for variance. It got a little bit muddled. Okay, okay, so let me try let me try and do that again. So it's it's certain that as you go into the tailing off part of the Gompert's function the reproduction number is less than one. Okay, you just calculate it. Right? And, and you can see that no matter what the serial interval is, that number has declined to below one. But then you get linear behavior. And all I'm doing is collecting another bunch of daily hospital admissions in London, for example. And all of a sudden I've got linear behavior. But that linear behavior means a reproduction number of one. Right? Same number appear in every period. So it has to be one. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have, a, we have a conundrum. What is it? Do we have some magical change where the, the virus that was doing this nice thing along the Gumpert's function somehow changes its mind and says, no, I don't like a reproduction number of 0.7. I'm going to put it back to one. It does a jump discontinuity. Well. I guess there are people who could imagine that. I was probably lots of mathematicians, but I can't. So the alternative is immediate. The alternative is that that Gompertz function continues on its merry way, and that that, <coughs> that variant is the owner of that Gompertz function and that n allocation of victims, and he continues until he's gone through all of them. The reason that there, the, that, but then there must be somebody else who's got a reproduction number bigger than one, right, to balance the one that's less than one. And effectively, what I must be seeing in this is a, a, like a weighted average of those two groups. One where they're reproducing at maybe 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and another where they're reproducing at <coughs> 1.3, 1.2, 1.3. And in, in fact, um, this is part of the hidden stuff. If you want to search for the variance, you kind of have to, you can't, you can't just sort of be half in on this Gompertz thing. You've got to believe that the new variant is also following a Gompertz function. And guess what? How do you find that? You simply subtract from the daily events that you're picking up that have produced this linear growth. The Gompertz, the original Gompertz function's contribution. The excess follows a Gompertz function. 
So you're really seeing a superposition of Gompertz functions as new variants are popping out. I, that, right, so but what would explain then that the superposition gives you exactly the linear thing that you're seeing? It doesn't for long, the thing is it doesn't for long. Right. And, and what you see is, as I said, it, it's, it's piecewise linear with declining slopes. So you're running out of steam at various points. I mean, for example, in the Portuguese data, um, you know, there are, there are days when in all of Portugal there might only be one or two cases in the summer, 10 million people, right? So it gets very, very sparse. But you look at the cumulative, there's a fantastic fit to a Gompertz function. So, you know, there, I'm, I'm I'm extrapolating a little bit here. We haven't dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. Sure. But I know, I know what the sentence says, I, right? I mean, yeah. at this point, I... <laughs> right, so uh, another question. I, I, I think that, at least when I try to get a mental picture of this reproduction number, right? So that, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's presumably due to contact between people and uh, so, and, and I mean, I guess the, the explanation that we've been given by newspapers and colleagues who've gone to the press to speak about this, that for the number going down, is mostly that at some point, you know, start having more contacts, I mean, infected people start having more contacts with people who are already infected. Sure. That right? Or, I mean, maybe there, uh, there's a lockdown and there are fewer contacts in overall, right? Um, yeah, what I, what I have a hard time, I mean, that, that my question is, can we reconcile this mental image with what your model is showing? Uh, uh, this is my model and your mental image, that's yeah. a, that's a well, tough one. Well, not my mental <laughs> image, I think that's a, kind of the standard <laughs> mental image. Okay, is so, a, so the thing is, um, well, I haven't thought about it much because I can calculate it. So I do calculate it. And I graph it for different serial intervals. And I see what it does. Right? It just goes, it, it, I mean, when I yeah, looked I at it. I guess the question is more in the direction of, I mean, how do we, I mean, you present an open problem in the direction of, okay, let's try to come up with a dynamical model. Well, places, but, right? uh, uh, yeah, actually, well, we, I kind of, I think, pretty sure I know how to do, do that. Good. So, so yeah. one of the things that happened uh, was, I mentioned Gabriela Gomez. I don't, I don't know if you've, know her. She's visited Fio Cruz here, I guess, but she's, um, she's in uh, Scotland, but she got sort of uh, marooned in Porto for a long time during the whole thing. So um, we've been talking to her off and on. She realized, as they all do, uh, they know that the heterogeneity assumption is completely wrong. It's just not tenable, but that's what they use. No, the homogeneity. Homo sorry, yeah, homogeneity. Sure. And so Gabriella said, look, you have to make it heterogeneous. And when you do that, the, reproduction, the uh, herd immunity threshold can be a lot lower than you think. Yes. Now, this came out in the spring of 2020, except, well, it didn't really come out because journals told her that she couldn't publish it because it might cause people to go out and party in the streets instead of staying at home. <laughs> Literally, they refused to publish a paper because they thought it might induce the wrong kind of reaction in the public. Um, she was also low on the herd immunity number. She had something maybe, you know, as low as 15%, something like that. Whereas, I mean, we know what it is. It's 37%. You see it. You can, you can read it off those graphs. Um, but she, she went back. She kept plugging away. And she finally published a, a, a couple of papers about it. Um, and she's, she's made heterogeneity conditions that actually match the, the English um, uh, deaths data, I think, and Scotland as well. And those give a pretty good fit. It's not perfect, it's, sure. but it's more like a Gompertz, it's closer to a Gomp. no, it's close to a Gompertz function, it's just the wrong Gompertz function. It doesn't fit the data as well as, as the Gompertz function that we compute does, by quite a bit. I mean, think the mean square error is three times as high, something like that. But it shows absolutely clearly that with just giving up on this homogeneity idea, 
you can actually get a realistic model of what's going on. And of course, the homogeneity is the problem. You just can't keep meeting more and more people. And but that's what you see in the Gompertz picture, right? It, you're, it's the effect of the fact that you simply can't get that many more contacts without overlapping with people that have already been involved. Yeah, but it, I, I'm guessing heterogeneity is something stronger, right? That also kind of, uh, let's say, there, the people will react differently to the virus. Oh, well, and right. Effect, There's so it goes sort beyond the, that, not just. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the very simplest version of this is simply that the, that the, that the, that the, the, the parameters that appear in the SIR or SEIR model have to be time dependent. Okay. Now, people have, this is one of the strange things about this subject. People have developed incredibly sophisticated takes on this with networks here and behavior modifications there, all sorts of massive calculations because they can. But the question is, what's the reason to believe that any of that describes the real world? And there's, no, there's never been an answer to that. I haven't, I mean, I'm hoping that in some of the inquiries into what went wrong, um, somebody's actually going to be asked that. We don't have Richard Feynman anymore, unfortunately. But somebody needs to ask, what is it that makes you believe that your scenarios represent what happens in the real world as opposed to the model world? And, and this is not just, you know, this is not just wild-eyed uh, Neil Ferguson type modelers. Sinetra Gupta will tell you that the models shouldn't be used for prediction, but they're good for evaluating scenarios. Well, I'd love to ask, what's the basis for your belief in that? It's true that they're good for evaluating scenarios in the model world. There's no question about that. Where's the connection between the model world and the real world? Where's the data? That's I think Anna wanted to add something. <laughs> Pretty much the same. You said that people are saying the reason the reproduction number decreases the amount of people you. This is our assumptions, right? Yeah. So I hope what we show is that this model, it's something that describes the interaction between the virus and the human being, immune system. And uh, that shows that from all these different examples, it seems to be quite universal. So we should really look at the model as, as a way of giving you the hypothesis and not, and not trying to imagine what you think is reasonable because we don't know. Yeah, what we don't know is enormous. That's all. No, that, that Antarctic example, I think, is a killer. Um, it, you just, who should he have isolated himself from? And if he put himself in one of those Madam She, Bat Lady plastic outfits, when he got the cold, would the other five have become infected? Well, quite likely, right? I mean, it, it's a, st and in fact, there was a, there was an Antarctic expedition this time too, I think an American one, where uh, they did the isolation, they did all the stuff, and then everybody got COVID. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the journal it appeared in is tip top. It's a journal Hybring, Hygiene Cambridge. It's now Journal Hygiene London it transition, but it's, you know, that's a top drawer um, journal. That was 50 years ago. Um, and, but, you know, uh, Kermack and McKendrick was almost 100 years ago, and we don't seem to have progressed a lot with that. But, but by the way, that is, there's another thing that, that I should mention, and that's that. Um, it's entirely possible that it's only in humans that this uh, viral uh, process follows the Gompertz function so beautifully. Um, I, know, I know that we looked at uh, bubonic plague, which was what Kermack and McKendrick were originally studying in Bombay. And um, there you can get a better fit with, uh, with a logistic distribution. <coughs> than you can with the Gumbel di distribution. And I also found the same thing, somewhat disconcertingly. I found data somewhere. The British uh, were very keen record keepers in the Raj, and they had, they had rat data. They had data following the 
life and death of, of the plague rats. And that was, honest to God, not even close to a Gompertz distribution. It was logistic. And another example I found, uh, something called Farr's Law, where William Farr, back in the mid-18th century, 19th century, I think, uh, was convinced these things followed a normal, a, a model like this, but with a normal distribution. And he, he worked out uh, things, and he actually gave a comparison with cow plague, which I sus think was probably rinderpest, the only other thing besides smallpox that has actually been er eradicated. And you look at the nonlinear regression fits, and normal isn't even close. Uh, it's much more like Gompertz, but Gompertz isn't nearly as close as logistic. It's absolutely, you, you, you couldn't possibly conclude that that should be modeled by a Gompertz function. On the other hand, uh, human bacteriophage virus in the lab, and this is data from McKendrick, I think, um, does follow a Gompertz function. It's not even close to the one he likes, which is logistic. Um, you know, it's a, the, it, judging by the error. Now, there's not a lot of data points. So, so there should be some experiment. There should be some lab work done on, the, on this. And I hope there, there will be. Um. So, yeah, I think that people are getting a bit impatient. So maybe now take the discussion <laughs> offline. But, well, thank you very much to the two of you for the talk. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming.